everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the GDC. This is a lecture about uh, digital uh, pixelization in the 22nd century. And you're in the, uh, actually, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, you are in the right room. This is uh, the NBA Jam postmortem, and uh, I'll be heading the surgery. Uh, no uh, radio playing, gambling, spitting during the uh, procedures, and if you'd like to turn off your cell phones. Uh, imagine, if you will, 2001 Space Odyssey music playing behind. That's what I had in my mind. Let's go back to a simpler time. The 90s, a decade defined by profound change, world-changing events, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, yes, the cloning of the first mammal. Bleh! It was a big moment, I remember that. But, meanwhile, the Hubble telescope goes into orbit. The Gulf War. But meanwhile, in Chicago, at Midway Games, a new era was being ushered in. A renaissance in the gaming industry would explode onto the scene, shattering records in coin-up earnings and sales. The game was a turning point. It was revolutionary. It was Mortal Kombat? Wait, what? Hold on, I know what you're thinking. I, I kind of thought the same thing too. But uh, then like shortly after that, month, maybe two months tops at best, the real game changer, where are you at Boone? Yeah, the real game changer came along. Welcome to NBA Jam, boom shakalaka. The game changer the world was waiting for had come at last, the savior of the coin-up business and maybe the killer of the uh, pinball game there, but that's another story. NBA Jam would go on to become the highest earning coin-up game of all time. That's pretty amazing. And I was one of the highest paid performers at that time, $600 I believe. <coughs> Uh, for a game that would earn a lot of money. Uh, yeah, it was a new era, and uh, that's why we're all here in the room right now. It was 25 years ago today that Mark J. Termel gave fan gamers a new game to play. And all you gamer geeks that know codes, MJT0322 is his birthday. The man with the biggest head on the planet, because he invented the big heads. It's 6'6", six, six, hailing from Michigan, one of the originals of Troy Bad Boys. The man in the middle of the gaming industry, Mr. Zeus himself, MJT, it's his birthday. Give him a big round of applause. The six foot six legend. Uh, High five. Hi. All right. His birthday. How, how fitting is that? And now, co creator. At six foot four, he was the guy. Well, you know. Maybe 5'10, 5'11. He wore shoes. Six feet, we'll call six feet. Sal Davida. You may remember him. He was also one of the actors in Mortal Kombat. There's all the great visuals. The genius, Sal Davida, Mark Bell. We're glad you guys got up early. I know there's been a lot of partying. Thanks for being here. We're going to have some fun. And let's uh, get the surgery and the post mortem off to start here. Thanks, guys. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Tim Kitzrow. Uh, Tim is a, a rare talent. Uh, Tim, Sal, and I uh, not only did NBA Jam, but then we went on to do NFL Blitz, and uh, Tim was amazing uh, on both products. Oh, that was totally unnecessary, Mark, but a whole lot of fun to hear. <laughs> uh, and so it's been, uh, it's been great uh, working with these guys over the years. Um, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, talking to my uh, brethren uh, in the, uh, the games business. Uh, a lot of you are probably too young to even remember NBA Jam or to have played it, uh, but uh, you know, many probably did uh, immerse themselves in it uh, a time or two. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, representing the team, not just these guys, but uh, the team that uh, put the game together. Um, it was really uh, kind of a magical time uh, back at Midway uh, there in the 90s. Um, so let's, uh, let's flash back to 1993 uh, because, again, some of you probably don't remember this, 
but 25 years ago, the game was introduced. Uh, we did it at an NBA uh, All-Star game. It was in Utah. A lot of the players came over, you know, they shuffled over, took, you know, took a look at this game. Uh, they all got a copy of the coin-op game, $3,500, you know, $3,900 uh, piece of equipment, but they were mad. Every single one of them I talked to was mad because either they weren't in the game because I had selected the wrong players, or they didn't like their stats. Uh, so it started right, right then and there. Um, you know, you hear that over the years where these athletes are unhappy with their stats. But uh, 1993, and this slide right here, uh, up in the upper right corner really tells the whole story here. $2,468, that's one week of earnings at one of our uh, locations. Uh, every arcade uh, around the country, of course, what they do is they, they track their revenue on a per game basis. They're trying to shuffle in new games, get rid of the games that aren't making money. Hey, Mark, give them a frame of reference. Like, what did the average game make? It's there on the screen. So the number two game is, uh, you know, <laughs> virtual racing. Yeah. But um, so $2,468 was just such a stunning number because at a, as a $3,500 or $3,900 uh, price point for these coin-op machines, well, the operator, the owner of that device, can pay it off in a couple of weeks, and then it's pure gravy from, from there forward. What it all added up to with the number of coin-op units we sent out there, and that the uh, actually averaging around $700, it comes out to a billion dollars in that first 12 months. That's four billion quarters. I mean, it's crazy. We talk nowadays about you know, microtransactions and, uh, you know, these games are, are crushing it here and there, the, the Candy Crushes, the Clash of Clans. Well, here's a game that really uh, kind of set the tone for microtransactions when you think back on it. Uh, at the same time, Jurassic Park was the breakout film, became the number one film of all time at about $350 million uh, grossing. That was unheard of at the time. And so it, it really kind of puts it in perspective. Uh, the game just really uh, blew up. Of course, then there was Come a lot on. of anticipation. Sorry, I'm a little off today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little <laughs> late. <It> blew up. <laughs> uh, uh, that created a lot of anticipation uh, for the, the home versions. Uh, and so we were on the cover of these magazines. You can see here, uh, uh, Ed Boone, I don't know if you noticed that, uh, that first line, it says, better than Mortal Kombat? <laughs> Le leave uh, it alone. But, yeah, straight, no. but uh, no, we were really uh, excited uh, just to see the kind of the anticipation and, uh, and the coverage, uh, you, know, uh, you know, gaming guides and, and uh, so forth. But, uh, and indeed, uh, we actually delivered. Uh, the home version uh, came out. It was a, a faithful uh, conversion of the coin-operated game. Uh, and we sold uh, millions of cartridges uh, that, that year of NBA Jam. It was a Bitcoin of its day. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah. People couldn't believe it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it, was, uh, you know, it was a crazy time. Um, but so that's stepping back to 93. What we're really here to try to cover are some of the stories, some of the how it, how it actually came to, uh, you know, came to exist, and some of the problems and challenges and, and kind of goofy things that happened. So that's what we're going to do today, is kind of talk through some of those stories, uh, and then we're going to have a little Q&A um, if anybody has questions uh, toward the end. Uh, both Tim and Sal will, will interject uh, as we go forward here. But it's not going to be like behind the music VH1 where everybody had drug problems and rehabs. <laughs> yeah. It's a really happy story. Yeah, yeah, we're, it's we're post-mortem, but it's a happy no, story. I have that slide. <coughs> oh, you did? You did you I do. I have that slide. Yeah. Oh, you, oh, you had the slide. Right. We were mostly no. um, but I, I do have to, uh, you know, acknowledge the team right off the bat. Uh, again, we're up here, you know, I'm honored to, uh, to represent, but uh, here on the lower left-hand picture, uh, Tony Gosky, uh, he's still uh, killing it, I'm sure, on the Mortal Kombat uh, franchise there in Chicago. Uh, John Carlton is the lower left, uh, an artist. Uh, I'm up top, Sal's there in the middle. Uh, Jamie Rivette, uh, kind of brooding in the back there uh, with the black <laughs> hair. I still have the honor of working with him on a, on a daily basis uh, at uh, Zynga today. Uh, he, he did the uh, Smash TV um, uh, conversions for the consumer wow. side. Uh, Smash TV was my first coin-op game. Uh, so he's, he's been killing it for decades. Uh, John Hay in the lower right-hand corner is uh, the audio guy. We always used to say the sound guy. 
uh, wrote a lot of the music and was in the studio with Tim yeah. uh, to come up with all those phrases. Uh, and yeah, then in the, the <clears throat> yep. yep, in the upper right, uh, John Newcomer uh, standing there. He's still in the business today. Uh, and then I put uh, Sean Liptak here because he wasn't in any of the other photos. Um, he was uh, kind of our brainiac engineer. Uh, did a lot of really cool things. So I wanted to acknowledge the team. And of course, Tim Kitzero, uh right there in the studio in the upper. He's on fire. <laughs> yeah. And at lower right, the, the hairdos of the time. We didn't talk about that. That's uh, the the Robert Plant and the. Bono, Bono, uh, the wrestling. Yeah. wrestling. Who Pro wore it wrestling. best? You decide. Right, right. Yeah, some, uh, some good, good hair back in those days. Um, how it began. So it's really, when you think about Midway in that era, uh, you're familiar with NARC. Uh, that was this new hardware platform that Eugene Jarvis had uh, developed uh, there in Chicago. They crafted a game that had some digitized imagery in it. There was a a red Porsche, and you know there were characters walking around. You were trying to take out drug dealers. Uh, it was really the first violent game. Even there were a lot of body parts. You know, you'd blow people up with you know bazookas. Uh, but uh, the rest of the industry too was starting to dabble in digitizing, of taking. Uh, you know, there was claymation on this Primal Rage game. Uh, you know, people were starting to try to to uh, get these images off of VHS tapes or Hi8 tapes and put them onto the screen. And so we were all internally kind of you know, geeking out on that. Uh, my art partner on Smash TV and Total Carnage was John Tobias, uh, an amazing artist. I have the honor to work with him actually now on a, on a daily basis as well at Zynga. But he was incredible at, at drawing and, and painting. Uh, but he wanted to do digitized graphics. He branched off and joined up with Ed to create Mortal Kombat. Uh, and then I branched off to, uh, to dabble in digitized graphics to do NBA Jam. Didn't start out, though, as an NBA licensed product. Uh, we, uh, we knew we wanted to get characters. Basketball was, it's, it's, I'm a big fan. It was something that could leverage that tech. I went out onto the streets to try to find some talent to shoot. So I was cruising around YMCA's and, you know, in kind of the inner, inner parts of the city trying to look for some talent. Found some guys, you know, paid them some money to come into a studio and said, hey, we want to shoot you to, to do this. We'll pay you this hourly rate. Uh, so we got some talent to come in. And uh, you can see actually a little couple of snippets here of, the, uh, of those early sessions. Uh, we had the camera rolling on a track and the characters. We painted the wall uh, blue. We put blue uniforms on the players. We saw this on, on TV, on the you know, weather report. Uh, I'll let Sal talk about that later yeah. uh, to explain uh, brilliant the, idea. the strategy yeah. behind uh, blue on blue. Really smart. But, <clears throat> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that. I'm getting started. <laughs> blue demons. Um, so uh, about uh, halfway through the project, uh, the president of the company, Neil Nicastro, he came in and he said, you know, why not try to get an NBA license? It didn't really even occur to me that, you know, that would be in the realm of possibility. That had never happened before. Um, you know, we're just a you know, small coin-op company, it, it felt like. Uh, but we put together a video. This is a, a short little piece of the video that we sent off to the NBA. Yeah, the real video is like 10 minutes long, or 5 Williams minutes Williams Electronics is currently developing an arcade-based four-player video basketball game, one which employs lifelike digitized graphics. <laughs> if granted an NBA license, we would elevate this game beyond any computer sports simulation ever done, allowing players to choose their favorite team and see and hear the names of recognizable players would be fantastic. The six-foot-high NBA logo on the side of the cabinet would undoubtedly attract much attention and generate even more excitement. Thank you for viewing this work in progress and for considering our request. So it was a little bit longer, this video. We sent that off, and we kind of you know, waited anxiously to hear how they'd respond. I didn't expect them to you know, uh, accept it. And sure enough, we got uh, a phone call back that they had, you know, rejected. The rejected. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we um, get that stuff out of here. I can go all day. Yeah. <laughs> we. Uh, but I was surprised at the reason they rejected us. 
uh, they basically said, we don't want our NBA logo in these CD arcade locations. And we were like, you know, well, yeah, I've seen a few CD arcades, but that's not the normal arcade uh, experience. But their reference point was Times Square in New York City, uh, because that's where their offices were. And at that time, there in the 80s, Times Square was very, you know, grungy, a lot of, you know, prostitution, a lot of drugs, and a lot of that was happening at these 24-hour... And, and if you're a corporate NBA guy, where are you hanging out? Right. <laughs> right. Where are you spending right. all that money? Right. And uh, so they didn't at want to be seen in there. <laughs> but uh, so they said, hey, you know, we don't want our NBA logo. I don't want yeah. my wife to know where I'm going. Right. Six feet tall. Or our fans. <laughs> yep. And plastered there in, the, uh, in those locations. And so we were taken aback, but we said, oh, we can solve this. And so we went and we created a new video that went to bowling alleys and family entertainment centers and Mormon you know, churches. Yeah, we have more of the normal um, you know, location uh, for coin-operated games, and it worked. They, uh, they got that, they said, okay, we understand, uh, and they worked out a deal that was, was very reasonable. I think we were only paying them about 100, 150 bucks a game uh, on that you know, $3,500 uh, you know, uh, price point. So it was a pretty good deal to get that NBA license. And uh, that brought up, of course, then the problem. Uh, we're halfway through development. Uh, you saw kind of the state of the game, you know, players running around, you know, had shot a lot of footage. Um, but uh, it brought up all these issues of, okay, players, and uh, you know, how, do we, how do we leverage all that? How do we get this content? This, uh, you know, small, too small to read, but I'm highlighting here a couple of things. One, we were asking for source material, like, you know, can you take photos of, of the players? Back in those days, there were no, uh, you know, NBA photos they took in, you know, preseason camp. Yeah. Uh, we uh, referenced down here at the bottom, it says, uh, what do you think about the name NBA Jam or NBA Showtime? We eventually used both names, of course. But, um, so it's, a, it's the opening letter uh, there in um, August of 92. Uh, with kind of what our requests were, including the, the players. And the players, again, there was no internet. Uh, there was no DirecTV NBA League Pass package. Uh, it was just uh, me and John Hay, the, the sound guy, um, kind of looking at, uh, we, we were fans, but we had to look at the, you know, the newspaper and, you know, try to so figure out. So picking your favorites. Yeah, picking our favorites, you know, who would look good out there on the screen, you know. We're, uh, we're making those choices. I've gotten a lot of heat over the years with some of the selections. Uh, some of the players you know, weren't worthy of being in the, the final two. But um, yeah, it's part of, the, part of the lore. And you would have cut Chicago out altogether if you could have done that, right? Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. I'm, uh, no Chicago. I don't even reference that in, this, uh, <laughs> in the deck here. But uh, some of you who are you know, aficionados of these secret codes, I did have uh, cheat codes in against the Bulls uh, when they played the Pistons, <laughs> because I was a big Pistons fan, so uh, I, it was my only way with Jordan rising, it was my only way to kind of level the playing he field. He was working with Chuck Daly and the Jordan rules. <laughs> yeah, so right, underhanded. Right, right. But so that, that brought us to, okay, now we need these players, we've got to have a broadcast look. We need a broadcast announcer, we need to be you know, up our game. Uh, and so that, uh, that was the next problem. And that's where we really, you know, got Sal involved to, to try to solve that problem. And so I'll let you, um, you know, talk about uh, a couple of these, yeah, these sure. things on the tech side. Sure. Yeah, actually, uh, the, so getting all the, the challenge of getting all the, the players in the game and making it look broadcast and whatever, that was, you know, huge. Uh, our, our team, what, two guys, three guys, Tony as well, we, we were like scratching our heads. How do we get all the players in the game and, and how do we make it look like TV? Well, luckily we had an advantage with our hardware. Our hardware was amazing. It, it gave us the ability to, most hardware uh, for video games at the time had like 16 colors uh, of just a few palettes they could put on the screen at any one time or 32 or something like that. But we had the ability to put uh, 256 palettes of 256 colors which if we were creative enough could make, you know, pretty much make it look like unlimited colors on the screen. So it gave us the ability to get all these beautiful like flesh tones and all these beautiful highlights. And, and, so, and also when the videos were shot, you know, all the details in the skin 
came out um, to an extent, except for you know how it was shot. So, so um, <clears throat> we the the to get the characters in the game, we thought we had an advantage by shooting them against the blue screen, uh, the digitized footage, because it would automatically cut them out from the background, and then, then we'd have footage to, um, we'd have those, those frames to choose to put them in the game. And actually, there's a little, little video here that shows the process of that, and here I'll just go through that Everyone who has seen this work in progress agrees we have a hit on our hands. First, basketball players are videotaped in a studio performing hundreds of moves. Then, artists digitize this footage into individual frames, which are stored and played back in sequence or animated to create a video basketball player capable of performing on command. Artists are also creating every other element of the basketball experience, including the court. That's enough of that. So that's all you need to know about that. So it looks really clean. It's like, oh, look cool. All the characters just pulled right out of the background. But unfortunately, like Mark mentioned, we had sh uh, shot the characters against a blue screen that wasn't really lit well, like where it could be easily chroma keyed away. So that was our first challenge. The second challenge was we shot it on videotape, which meant the quality was pretty blurry and all the edges of the, of the, of the characters just bled into the background. So we had to go in uh, and then also we shot with blue Uniform. Jerseys, yeah, right. <laughs> uniforms, <laughs> right. which Genius. against the blue screen, <laughs> so the chroma key didn't quite work for that either. So we had a hand cut out every frame of animation on every character for, for every single animation. We'd go through and strip stri pixel by pixel. And so part of our hardware tools were uh, a suite of custom tools that allowed us to step frame by frame, pixel by pixel, put on our headphones, you know, zone out, and for months just cut out every frame of animation. And, that, uh, and, then, and then we had to go through and tint all the edges because all the blue screen from the background just bled right into them, right across. So to pretty much shape out every character uh, of every, um, uh, on every, uh, uh, every different character. Then we had different skin tone characters. So we had, a, we had to unify all their skin tones so that we could use every animation for every character. So we had to tint all the skin all together to like a medium tone. So it could be easily with a, a palette, the, the index colors of palette that we had, which meant that we, I'm not gonna go into detail, but you could change that to be um, any, any shade that you want in, of, for skin and then jersey, and we could change out the jersey colors. So by doing that, uh, it allowed us to, uh, our hardware allowed us to have flexibility and freedom with that. But then the real challenge was the, the heads, the NBA characters themselves. How were we gonna get every NBA character in the game? Like we just shot the few guys that we shot and that was daunting to strip out and to get into the game. So we had to come up with a system for how we could actually get their faces uh, in there and we came up with one based on uh, tech from previous games. It was like an object attach point something you'd use for like, you know, holding guns or weapons or picking something up and moving it around. It's like a little, we call them animation points, but it's like a little point that you stick on every single frame, you stick on to the part of the body that you want the object to attach to. And we said, hey, why don't we use that for maybe putting heads on the guys? So we, oops, we lopped off the heads of the animations and then we had to come up with uh, a way of attaching the head uh, that we wanted, but we but the characters are moving around. They're like all you know buzzing around. So we had to assign a head angle, and you can see it there for every frame of animation, depending on which way the character was facing. So that was truly daunting. Luckily, you know we had a talented group of guys uh, that could <laughs> extract the heads from things like magazines, slides, there was no internet. So we had to go to the store and like, okay, let's look through these, you know, these mag, oh cool, there's a head angle here that we could use for, you know, uh, Olajuwon or whatever, right. yeah. And so we'd, we'd watch the shows, on, uh, the, the, the games, and we'd record them on videotape. I'm like, oh, there's one right there. And so we'd take that tape, bring it to work, and then we'd, you know, scan it and whatever. So it was a nightmare to do, um, and then we had a hand touch stuff, and then we got savvy in the end where we noticed that, oh, you know what, from the back, you know, yeah, these guys kind of look the same, and these guys kind of look the same, and these guys <laughs> totally cheated yeah. on a lot of that it, stuff. It, it might have been easier to just invent the internet. <laughs> we should, go get all the we should have totally done I mean, that, yeah. looking back now. Actually, uh, Tony Gosky. You guys uh, are smart. <laughs> Tony Gosky, again, he is an amazing artist uh, on the Mortal Kombat team, and he w started just hand doing these things. 
he'd say, no, you know what, let me just, let me just paint this guy. It, right. it was fast for him to, to create it yeah. and to digitize it. Yeah, he's a freak though. Yeah. But yeah, so we, we had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our tools allowed us uh, a lot of flexibility yeah. and, and help on that. So, yeah. all right, back yeah. to you, Mark. Great, thanks. So. When you say a guy's a freak, he's a freak. When you guys, I mean, <laughs> right. you guys right. do. <laughs> um, a lot of stories that I could go into on this game. A lot of uh, interesting things. We're going to touch on, on a bunch here in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, but a lot of it uh, is tech related. A lot of it is the kind of the CPU assistance uh, related. Um, I've gotten a lot of heat over the years for the cheating that happens uh, in, in NBA Jam or, or even NFL Blitz, uh, but a lot of games do it, um, and we had systems in place to, uh, you know, to neuter that or to remove it, but talking about a couple of the tech challenges, uh, might sound rather mundane, but it was a big technical hurdle for us, uh, shooting a pass to your teammate. Uh, initially, we had the teammate you know, stop and turn and accept the pass. But of course, you know, your opponent would come up and knock you down while the ball's in flight. So we uh, realized we had to keep the player running at his trajectory. So we locked him in and let him run, and then he would you know, reach back and catch it. You know, we counted the number of ticks before the ball would, receive, you know, would get to him, and we'd start the proper animation at the right time. But then, of course, that carried him into the sideline. We didn't want to ever let a player step out of bounds or pass out of bounds. That was a, a fail. So he had to get to the sideline, and then he had to glance off and continue to run down the sideline. Uh, and so then the ball at pass time had to take that all into account. Uh, and so it was quite a challenge. We iterated on that for... And really, this is about the decisions that had to get made to emulate what somebody would want to be doing or, or what somebody would expect to happen while you're playing the game. We want to eliminate frustration from our game, and that's something that the other games yeah. had. That's why like, when, you, when you did a pass in other games, they would literally stop and wait for the ball yeah. to come to them. Or the or ball like, would just hit you in the body and attach to you. Right. So you know, we wanted down. to you know, rotate and you know, Make we had this variety more, of catches. More real, and then again, anticipate what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. And so as, as responsive and as seamless of a gameplay flow as possible is what we were trying to yep. achieve. And lots of decisions were made and, and good code written to do that. Yeah, it was, a, it was a can of worms because, again, imagine that you're shooting a pass. Well, you know the player's running in this direction, so I'm going to shoot it like this. But he's really going to glance off the wall halfway through right. his run and be down there. So I really need to you know, rotate and shoot it in this way. Take into way. account where he'd be yeah. after he glances off the wall right. and travels yeah. a little bit in that amount of time. And so, then, so maybe that, now that opens up a behind-the-back right. pass or... You know, so there were a lot of, it was a big can of worms. Yeah. Uh, so that was one topic. Uh, leap to rim for dunks. Uh, we, uh, at, at uh, Midway, we created this system called Leap At. Uh, and you're probably most familiar with um, uh, NFL Blitz, where when you're running at an opponent, you hit the tackle button, and it just like a, it's like a missile, a heat-seeking missile. It rotates, and it gets to... Uh, it gets to the victim right. in X number of ticks. Well, that same concept is the leap at for the, the wrist to the rim. And so a player would uh, go up for a dunk, and we knew we had to you know, reach the rim, and based on how many ticks uh, I would establish for that, that point of connection would dictate how high the player would go. If I said, well, get there in two seconds, well, it's gonna have to go way up and then come way down. If it's one second, then it's a little bit more normal. Which is ironically how the big dunks happen, because like just by mistake, you'd put in some number that was too big, and the guy would shoot up in the air. It's like, whoa, that was really cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I spent uh, you know weeks and weeks and weeks uh, just on animations. That was my you know kind of my main focus. Once we got all this art, was crafting all of it together and creating the dunks and even combining a portion of one dunk, uh, a, spin, a spin dunk from this angle yeah. would actually work from this angle if I combined it with this. And so it was like this big puzzle piece uh, that modular, we were able to Modular together. pieces, so the dunks became very modular. Mm -hmm. Every part of a dunk could then flow into a different part of another dunk, and mm -hmm. we got really creative yeah. with that, and that's what gave us a lot of belief. Yeah, and we, you know, the high dunks were a little bit controversial. Some people were like, no, no, that's too, uh, you know, that's crazy. We're trying to make a simulation here. Um, but, uh, you know, we tried to find a balance. Uh, Eugene Jarvis, uh, you know, who was my mentor and 
uh, somebody that has made, you know, obviously in a, a big dent in this business, uh, he would come in, I would show him a dunk, and he'd say, yeah, that's pretty cool, but why don't you go a little bit higher? Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I joke with Ed, you know, I'm sure he said the same thing to Ed over the years, like, yeah, that's cool, but how about a little bit more blood? <laughs> you know, and he did the same thing with Smash TV and with Mutoid Man, all these things. So he had a really interesting uh, take on things. But uh, so that was uh, the leap at, uh, shattering backboard. Uh, we didn't think we'd get away with it, but the NBA allowed it. They, they, uh, s they soon shut that down. The next year, they actually eliminated all the NBA games from doing such a thing. Uh, the on-fire mode in Burger King, uh, Jamie Rivette, who I mentioned, uh, he's an Australian fellow. I work with him still today. Did the Smash TV conversion. We would walk to Burger King. And um, for those that know me, I'm like pretty much all business all the time. I'm always talking about the task at hand and the game that we're working on uh, in off hours. And so we're walking to lunch. It's kind of annoying sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm, uh, so we're walking and just, you know, talking about, you know, what do we need? This game isn't quite there. And, and uh, he came up, he said, well, what if we went into an on fire mode? What if you got stronger somehow? And so over the course of the Burger King lunch, we plotted out the, the whole three in a row, heating up, uh, being able to goaltend as, a, as one of the benefits. And so in that one lunch, it all kind of coalesced together. We came back, we told Sal about it, and he was like, absolutely not. Yeah, that's, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Dumbest thing I've ever heard right? in my entire life. And um, he said, I'm not going to give you any art for well, any fire. Well, let me, <laughs> yeah, right. All right, calm down, yeah, yeah. calm down, right. Francis. <laughs> so uh, I, I was more in, towards the purist side. You know, I wanted to maintain, OK, well, this isn't a fantasy game. This is still basketball. I didn't mind exaggerated stuff. But then we're like, it, it kind of kept on going one more step. But what if we put, you know, what if we put bunny shoes on the guy and it made him <laughs> run faster? And it's like, that did know, look good, though. Right, yeah. Bunny shoes so I was just trying to maintain some sense of, of still television That's style right, That's right. so but uh, because he refused to give me any art correct uh, <laughs> I, I actually used <laughs> I actually used the uh, smash TV uh, explosion uh, art uh, and uh, we put that in the game and started piecing it together you know behind the ball and and then Sal I don't know within a day or hour said okay 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 this might be good yeah and it so took some de desensitization, yeah. desensitization of all that stuff for me to finally go oh yeah, yeah okay I thought Burger King the flame broiled burger was going to be the thing right that's what, <laughs> right no yeah, I, I haven't heard it. that no. story before yeah uh, CPU assistance I'll touch on this down here um, not very subtle uh, this is the thing I've taken a lot of heat for over the years um, this bottom table actually kind of tells it all. Uh, the basic system was every player did have a base uh, percentage, whether it was for stealing, shooting two pointers, three pointers, um, you know, blocking a shot because sometimes you know your hand would touch it, but we would ignore the collision or just kind of flash the ball. And then this table below uh, was basically a modifier to that base value for whatever the, the topic was. And you can see them in the middle, there's a zero. Uh, zero is when the score was tied. If the score is tied, then do no modification to the, your base number. But if you are losing, then it would slide to the left. I'm down by one point, two point. So we went all the way to down by 10 points. You can see a 25% uh, you know, additional add-on to the already 25% that was there for, say, in this example, a three-point shooting. And conversely, if you were uh, winning up by one, two, three, four, those number of points, then it would modify. And so you could get down to the point where, hey, I'm a great three-point shooter, but uh, I just nullified you completely because you're up by 15 points. And so that basic system was running amok through the entire game. We had probably, I'd say, uh, 40 different locations where I would insert this kind of logic for deflecting passes, rebounding, you know, goaltending, shooting, right. layups, dunks, doinked dunks. Everything had uh, percentages that boiled back and forth based on the score. Yeah. And we, we played the game every day, like multiple times a day. And this is when we 
could actually do that. And it was, uh, and every day, whatever would frustrate us, we would talk about and try to smooth it out and clean it out and come up with rules for it. And we'd even argue, it's like, you can't just do that. You can't just do this. Yeah. You can't just have a, a big head on everybody, whatever it is. And, but we'd talk about that <laughs> and, w yeah. and figure out, okay, what's the right balance? Yeah, the best part of that story that just jogged my memory is because I was doing all these number modifications and we were a big gambling crowd right. inside work. Uh, people would come over and want to play a game for cash, for vending machine vending products, machine whatever products. it was. <laughs> and uh, started, started and I, I knew like, you know, what the numbers were. It's like, why are you trying to play me? It's like, <laughs> so I was, I was, John Hay, you know, probably still owes me money, but uh, you know, took, took hundreds of dollars from this poor sound guy, yeah. <laughs> right? John Hay, I hope you're out there somewhere. Um, so that's uh, CPU assistance, a uh, little story. Uh, magic in the game, a lot of little things were magical, uh, but uh, uh, a couple of things that are noteworthy is, of course, the codes. Uh, codes were, uh, of course, happening on, on some of the uh, consumer titles. It was a growing uh, phenomenon, uh, but both Mortal Kombat and Jam really kind of took it over the top. This is all small print, but an example of um, you know, the codes, we had a CPU assistance off, so it would turn off all that, all that CPU slider, um, you know, bullshit. Cheating. No all that cheating, cheating yeah. yeah. Another thing here that's interesting, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at Zynga, I've been at Zynga now for um, almost seven years, and we kind of live and breathe data and numbers. Uh, you know, making a great game in today's uh, world, you know, takes not only good, you know, gut instincts, good sensibility, but it also takes understanding your consumer and being able to respond to that. And even back here 25 years ago, the uh, panel on the right here is an example of some of the data we were tracking uh, at each of these locations. Uh, a coin-op game has battery backed up uh, CMOS uh, RAM. And so even when the, the machine is unplugged, turned off, uh, it can still retain that data. And we could go into these uh, machines and we had a secret code, a secret back door. I can still do it on CoinUp machines you know, around the country and pull up the, the diagnostics, pull up the CMOS you know, backed up, battery backed up RAM and look at some of the data. Things like uh, how many times they go to the second period, how many times to the third period, how many people are buying a full game up front. Uh, what are the most popular teams? What's the score differential? Uh, which controller actually you were most likely to win from? Which, which controller, <laughs> right, uh, to see if there was bias there. Right. But a lot of stats were kept and, and a lot of decisions were made on this because of course we wanted to optimize and have players get all the way to the end. It was 50 cents per period, so $2 for a full game. If we had a player leaving after one period, you know, it was a lost opportunity. And that is the genesis of that CPU assistance system because we found that when players were ahead by 10 points at the end of the first period, they quit. If they were behind by 10 points, they quit. But if it's a tight game, they're like, okay, I see what you got. Stick it in there. You, know, you think you can take me? I'll come back. Um, and so, <laughs> Uh, that's really the genesis of trying to keep it, and you see it in driving games, the rubber banding that happens, um, but I could have been a little bit more subtle. But no, also, uh, we, that was also the genesis of the winning team. If it's a four-player game, the winning team stays on for free, because we wanted to encourage four-player games. We've got the most yeah, in a, yeah, in a, in a four-player game, the winning team gets to stay on the machine for free, uh, much like a fighting game right. um, you know, in the day. Um, this is a horrific story, oh, yeah. but it's a great story. Um, when you put out a, um, a coin-operated game, uh, we put it out at maybe the 80, 90 percent you know, completion point uh, into a few locations. And then we go at you know, 10 p.m., we plug in the, the EEPROMs, and we stand back and we watch. We turn to, it on and we local watch. Arcades. Local right. arcades. Local arcades in our area. Yeah. And so one of the, uh, the first uh, test locations uh, we had the game set up, and you'll probably you know, recognize these panels. The bottom left there is a typical four-player control panel where there's four sticks, three buttons, and we kind of angle things a little bit to give you a little bit of elbow room. 
But on the, the image in the upper right, you can see the, uh, the whole unit where there's a coin door down below, typical arcade game. When you plug your token or your quarter into those slots, it would go to a, a kitty. The machine has X credits, two, four, you know, five. You'd put in your coins and it would just be racking up credits. Then when you hit your start button on one of those four stations, uh, that is when the money comes from the kitty and you are controlling You're locked that, into that, that station. station. Right. And uh, so we were watching and this kid came up and uh, you know, he looked at the game, he said, oh, this is kind of interesting. He took his money out. He started putting quarters into the token and he had a jacket on, it was, it was you know, winter time, and he tapped the player two start button, boom, 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 and he, he bought into So that's the two. controller that was unlocked for him. Yeah, right. you can see the button here. Right. And uh, he took his coat off, set it down, but then he lined back up on the machine, and he lined up on station number three. And the way, of course, we coded the game, there were timeouts, so when you're trying to pick your team, uh, you know, his cursor was just sitting there, not picking anybody, but it auto-picks, uh, and then at jump ball time, you know, the players jump up, and, uh, you know, there's AI, and the action begins. His stick is doing nothing. He's his, moving it around. Right, he's moving his stick. Yeah, he's moving right? it. He's like, yeah. And his, the, the player, whenever player two would get the ball, he would just stand there, and he'd be dribbling <laughs> right. the ball. And, a, and the CPU you know, would go and steal the ball from right, him. Right, he's CPU, like, oh! A drone would steal it from him. And uh, so we were embarrassed. We were like, oh, man. And you know, one of our kind of rules of thumb was not interrupt players right. and don't tell them who we are. Right. Like going back into the past. Yeah. yeah. But um, so I walked up and I said, hey, uh, just so you know, uh, you're actually on player two. See these? It says insert coin there on station three. You're on these controls. And he's like, oh, OK, sorry, thanks. And he shifted over. And I went back to Saza, man, that's embarrassing. How are we going to fix this? And we, we kept watching. And about um, 45 seconds later, he's playing, and he stops, and he shifts back over to player three. <laughs> because it was a better experience for him. He had more fun no playing control. a dead controller than right? <laughs> controlling his character. Right. And so, uh, <laughs> so we were like, oh my god. And okay. so we went back to work that <laughs> night, wrong. and we invented this concept of, of bozo boxes. Right. Where, and you've probably seen it, when you hit the start button and you get into the game, a, a box comes up on your you know, quadrant of the screen that says, You're this one, idiot. <laughs> right. Yeah. You are Scotty Pippen. Jeez. You are red. You only control Scotty Pippen. Yeah. The, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we remedied it and you know, we put the color on the shoes. You, know, you are red. And, uh, so, and we also changed the AI right. uh, because the AI was you know juking and jiving and uh the ai was too good yeah. it was too yeah. aggressive it was pretty much playing for you if you yeah. let it it would pretty much play for you so we had to make changes there yep so i'm going to hurry through up here uh you may not have heard of this one there was actually a hidden tank game uh in nba gm uh sean liptak that brainiac engineer i was telling you about uh, was kind of geeking out on you know 3d learning 3d so he put together on this 2d engine uh, you know, a 3D uh, little engine. This was a tank that was, you know, gliding by. You could hit the shoot button and a little, you know, square bullet would go out, boom, 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 boom. And you could blow up these tanks that were gliding around and you could, you know, kind of rotate with your stick around this, uh, this little world. And, uh, you know, I kind of thought, well, you know, what are we gonna do with that? You know, you're wasting your time. We really need to be fixing this other bug over here. And, but, uh, you know, I relented and he kept it in and he said, yeah, I just want to be able to show people uh, here in the studio uh, how to activate it. So he put in some combination, push the stick up, or there's, you know, swirl. Yeah. And we accidentally launched with that feature uh, in the... In the attract mode, yes. Yeah, so if in the attract without mode. putting money in, because the, the whole idea was if you yeah. put money in and wanted to get to it, we'd let you do it. Sure, spend your quarter on looking at a tank game. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so we started getting letters from distributors that, you know, hey, what's going on? People can play this game for free and... Uh, but luckily, the game wasn't that engaging, and it would time out after like 60 seconds, so you know, it didn't really cause a problem on revenue. Um, secret players, big topic. Uh, you can see here, we, we actually snuck in some, uh, some Mortal Kombat characters. The NBA ended up having us pull those characters back out <laughs> at some point. No good! <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, there's some good footage out there um, online where, uh, you know, the, Raiden has some electricity and there were some effects. Ed approved it at the time, but he was, uh, he was wincing, I think, when he approved it. 
Um, Fine. And, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, asked me about Bill Clinton. That was really an Acclaim thing. Acclaim had the home rights to our games, and uh, they called and asked if they could put a couple more uh, characters in, and uh, so we said, sure. Um, I, just, I put the secret agent man up there because it's the best headline ever for me, being a big NBA fan. Uh, this was from Slam Magazine. And uh, you know the story of Mark Jamal, the NBA's greatest player. Uh, Dan, here is the the byline on that. About <laughs> that. One of my one of my favorite uh, articles ever. Um, Ken Griffey Jr. down there sent us photos. Wanted to be in the game. Gary Payton wasn't in the original roster. These guys are sending their photos with headshots. Well, well, first he sent us. First he just sent us a picture of his head, like you know, out here, at the yeah. beach somewhere, whatever he was doing. It's like, okay, if you want to be serious about this, we sent him our sheet, that little sheet that we showed you earlier of all different angles. And then he looked at that. He's like, yeah, okay, yeah. All right. And yeah. So he sends he us back to... exactly yeah. every picture, yeah. perfect. And I'm like, okay. This okay. is the best. Uh, this is the best slide in the game, in my opinion. Uh, you know, we were always trying to get reactions out of people in, at Midway, you know, whether it be the blood and guts of, of our games or the over-the-top, you know, dunks, the screaming, the announcing. Wow. Well, here's a letter from a distributor after NBA Jam came out, and you can see that your programmers have created a monster. <laughs> I think that programmer creative freedom has gone too far. <laughs> right? We thought it was a compliment at first. Right, yeah. The monster's like, oh, yeah, right. thank you. Thank and you it's much. because, this is the letter on the left, um, you know, he goes on, he references this, uh, these notes that people were putting on the side of the cabinet that had the secret codes. You know, kids were selling, you know, the codes for $5, $10. Yeah. And uh, this is before the internet, and right. so it was tough to learn these things. And uh, so he thought that was, you know, bad. And here the game's making, you know, a couple thousand dollars right. a week. I, I mean, wish I knew that. I could have been selling codes. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Make more, but, more money. For yeah. Me. So that's a, that's a feather in my cap right there. Uh, Playboy bunnies. When, uh, of course, we got the NBA license, we wanted to have cheerleaders in the game. We actually called up Playboy and we asked for models. And we had, uh, they sent over a couple of models and they were, you know, like current in that, that era. Uh, you know, in the magazines, and we we shot um, you know a few scenes for them. It was it tactful. was it, tactful yeah, scenes. This guy, he, right. hey Hef, yeah. yeah, Mark Tremel, send over a few Playboy buddies. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah, we're on California between Belmont and Addison. <laughs> yeah. What world do you live in? Yeah, right. It just it made sense. Slinging uh, hash at the time. Town. That was that was the 80s. Oh, where do you find models in Chicago? Right. Right. There. Uh, but um, uh, we. We had, uh, we made a mistake with all these codes. So many kids, you know, so many people were calling and asking about these codes. And uh, we communicated that the cheerleaders were in the game. And so everybody was trying to find the well, cheerleaders. Well, we, didn't, we didn't know how to say no to people. So they would ask us, are, do, are there codes for the cheerleaders? Can yeah. you unlock the cheerleaders? And we're like, yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so the, you know, kids are calling Playboy to find out, you know, they're, they're getting a hold of these, these girls at home. Um, you know, now it didn't help that we mocked up a false image of a cheerleader actually. Yeah. I did that like in deluxe paint, I think. And yeah. Yeah. We'll do this someday. Yeah. Let's so somebody it. asked, and I said, thing. Sal, you gotta let's let's put a chick yeah. on the screen, Duncan. Great right. idea. I'd yeah. And so uh, Jeffrey, you're supposed to be in bed. Who are you on the phone with? <laughs> I'm yeah. going to have uh, some Playboy um, codes. All right. <laughs> what? <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah. So there's. Uh, yeah, hold on, I we eventually know. did put uh, the cheerleaders in the game. Yeah. Because you know we could update EEPROM because um, we took right. some heat for it. Same thing had happened with the Pleasure Domes on Smash TV. <laughs> That's a different um, story. So almost wrapping up here, um, you know, what the fuck happened to Jam? <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually a sordid story. Um, we um, were, you know, working with Acclaim, and uh, Acclaim uh, wanted the license for themselves, no doubt, and the head of licensing from Acclaim had shifted to the NBA and was in charge of licensing there at the NBA. The nail in the coffin! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, exactly. Uh, and one day we got a phone call from the NBA and they said, hey, um, you know, what are you going to do with the NBA license? Uh, are you going to you know, stay the same or you know, what's your plan? And of course, our natural reaction was, oh no, we're going to innovate, we're going to do great new things, you know, we're going to go bigger and better, uh, you know, because we wanted to keep <coughs> making NBA games. And they took that uh, commentary as like, oh, they don't want to do NBA Jam anymore. And so they gave it to Acclaim. So Acclaim garnered the rights when our contract expired. 
uh, for the rights to NBA Jam, and they just drove it into the ground. Uh, here you can see an example of College Slam. It's a screen down below. You know, centers and forward guards, they, they made that. They made this NBA Jam Extreme, uh, you know, taking dunking from half court, doing all sorts of stupid things, and uh, really ruined uh, that brand. They still gave us the NBA license, though. So yep. while they handed over the NBA Jam name license to Acclaim, Right after the stage, but, but you can still they have... They placated us, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can still have an NBA license. Here yeah. you go. Here's we did NBA Hang Time next. Right. It was, uh, that game actually uh, holds up really well. It's yeah. more fun than Jam. It was better. And then we eventually did uh, NBA Showtime, you know, 3D, mm -hmm. uh, after we had done Blitz. But, so that's a little story on that. But the legacy lives on. I was uh, driving through LA uh, just here a few weeks ago. Boom, shock, lock on a window. I go in. Here's a uh, NBA Jam jacket they're selling. You can see the team select for each of the different uh, teams that were in that original game. You can buy that. And they even had a Mark Turmel, Duncan Funk, you can see there, uh, as a secret character uh, t-shirt that, uh, that you can buy. Uh, and up in the upper right, you can see a Boom Shakalaka. Uh, some of the teams in the NBA have, have grabbed Tim Kitzero and said, hey, can you come in and do some, something special for our uh, NBA Jam Day, uh, putting the new current players into you know, kind of that mindset. And um, you know, Tim, you, know, you are Mr. Boom Shakalaka. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, he has really almost single-handedly kind of kept the energy yeah. Uh, over the last several years. I've got to pay rent. i got to do something. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I but, went with the claim. I was a whore. I took the money. Yeah. <laughs> then I came back for hang time. I hate so, those yeah. guys. I'm glad well, you took the license. This, I had to put this in here, uh, rib Tim a little bit. This is, uh, I was going through all my paperwork. I found the original contract with Tim uh, there in it's 1989. Uh, $600 we paid Tim for all of that uh, commentary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. So, and he's gotten a lot of uh, great, um, you know, I think uh, publicity and gags. Here you can see he's with Fox, New, uh, you know, with Fox Sports. Uh, Tim and I did a NBA Jam Day at uh, the Staples Center here just in January, uh, where everybody who went into the stadium uh, received an NBA Jam a t-shirt. Limited uh, edition, but they're worth something now because Blake Griffin left uh, a week later. Right, that's right, uh, right. And DeAndre, the, the uh, Boom Shakalaka brothers. Yeah. Uh, so you can see Tim and I, we pumped up the crowd, and, and uh, you know, he's, he's just been great at uh, kind of keeping the brand alive. Um, so thank you for that. Started my career, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here good, today. Good. And uh, with that, um, we wanted to uh, open it up if there were any questions, uh, you know, relevant to Jam or even, even uh, beyond Jam. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to address those. Uh, there are microphones here to the sides if anybody wants to, uh, to partake in that. Hi. You kind of glanced on it in the presentation, the overtime is dollars. Yes. <laughs> um, and the scale of if you're, uh, if you're tied, then uh, you don't mess with the stats. Uh, I missed a dunk <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, uh, when the score was tied yeah. on the buzzer. Well, I remember I said there were about 40 spots. Uh -huh. so, I remember you missed yeah. that dunk. Yeah. So, <laughs> no good! Yeah, yeah. 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 If, uh, if you're down by three, yeah. you know, with five seconds left, <clears throat> you know, you're going to make the shot, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know more, more often. Uh, so there were other special rules, yeah. but if you did the CPU assistance off, secret mm -hmm. code, it nullified even those. Yeah, it was Shaquille O'Neal. I was a little pissed off. Yeah, oh. done, I can imagine. Oh. I'm, I'm a sorry. free throw I would have gotten, but... Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry but, about that. Was, <laughs> yeah. my, my actual question, uh, was that a midway thing? Was that something uh, you were told to do? Just No, that oh. was just, you know... Just you were my, evil. My instinct. Yeah, yeah I was... Okay. Okay. I think I can start to heal now. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank Nothing you. personal, just business. 
Thank you guys so much for the panel, also for the game, the games, huge fan. Uh, is there a kill switch or some sort of weird way that the versions of the game with, for example, Michael Jordan would just somehow find their way to the rest of the world? I say that mostly from a historical preservation perspective, because yes. there are a lot of people who really do want to have that sort of stuff for future generations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there are EPROMs out there of NBA GM with Michael Jordan. He was in the original game. I know Gary Payton has said recently, uh, he's got it, he's shown it. I have EPROMs, I don't have a cabinet anymore, <laughs> so I can't plug the EPROMs in to confirm they're still working, but um, it's on my list of things to do is to actually uh, plug those in somewhere and test them out, and then I will be more than happy to release them. Yeah, yeah I understand, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I'm doing arcade. Ma'am? Hey, so thank you very much for the talk, uh, extremely entertaining. Um, I'm curious, uh, since we're talking a bit about preservation here, uh, there are several revisions of NBA Jam in MAME, including uh, revisions of TE with the now-deleted Mortal Kombat characters and all the other goofy things. And uh, you mentioned the tank game, and I'm pretty sure the ROMs for that version of the game are still in there, but is it possible to release the actual code to access that? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we can do that. Yeah. Um, I'll give you my uh, business card uh, when, <laughs> at the end of this. Awesome. I will reach out codes? to Sean and get that to you. you Wonderful. Can, Thank yeah. you. Yep. Yeah. Sell them. Yep. Money. <laughs> so I uh, played the game a ton in college, and it actually got me interested in the NBA. <clears throat> and I was wondering if you ever heard from the NBA if the game itself had any impact on their business. It is. It's a great thing. It's, it seems crazy to state that NBA Jam had an impact on the success of the NBA, but there's no question it did. Uh, not just from the anecdotal comments we've had, but from the NBA themselves, uh, have said that a lot of players were not fans of the NBA, but the millions played the game, and then they became engaged. I hear it all the time, so no question. And on that point, too, uh, Russell Wilson's a good example. He's a, uh, a huge fan of NBA Jam, and he lived in North Carolina, but he was a Sonics fan. And he wanted to play uh, as a Sonics guy because he loved their uniform. He said, I was a bigger basketball fan and knew about players and teams he said I would never have known about. And so that's, that's really everybody's experience. There was only a couple games on a week, and it was the, high, the big market, the Celtics Lakers. So it was a way to introduce those, those yeah. uh, smaller market teams and players that you would have never heard of. Yeah. Uh, hey, guys. Um, I've been working with Jarvis for the last 15 years at, at Raw, and I've seen you guys around at, at stuff. But uh, just in that line, a lot of my friends, like John Hay and, and Petro and stuff, appeared in all your games and stuff. Uh, are there any guys that have not been revealed, that have like really secret like yeah. joystick combinations and stuff in addition with the initials that yeah, just I, nobody knows? That I've gotten really that a lot names. over the years, and, and actually everything was exposed. Um, so there's no, uh, no codes unexposed that I'm aware of. Uh, There's codes. I would know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, there, you know, one interesting thing real quick. Uh, have you ever heard the story about the haunted NBA Jam machines? Oh, yeah. Uh, Petrovich. This yeah. is a true story. Yeah, Drazen Petrovich. Petrovich died. I think it was in a car accident or something. Tragic. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, he was a starter. He was in the game for the, he was on the nets. And after he died, we were walking through the factory. Well, just even sitting in our coin -op games, yeah. yeah. The coin-op game started saying, Petrovich, you know, Tim's call. Oh, that was good. And it just, every once in a while, it would just say, Petrovich, in the attract mode, with the audio off. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a yeah. weird bug, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, again, thank you so much for just uh, sharing all these experiences. When you introduced in the injured stat, how much did that really affect players during games? Uh, the injured stat uh, had no bearing. Okay. <laughs> and I bring this up because yeah. for many of us who did play at home, and as we all got to be very good, instead of two on two, we played one on one on one on one. Uh, and to try to see whoever had the highest injured stat right. then essentially pays everybody else. Right. That's yeah. 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 So. yeah that's the, we would do similar to you know, use that to highlight who was you know, weak at of avoidance. Yeah. Yeah. Injur, you know, an injury stat is when you would get knocked down. And so we would kind of laugh like, oh, you can't even you know, swirl around these guys effectively. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Good one. Good. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, thanks. Uh, just a quick question. What did happen with Michael Jordan? Was it like licensing? Yeah, money? So well, they offered him $600 and he turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Michael Jordan, uh, he pulled out of all uh, NBA licensing uh, because all the players just split the licensing money equally. And so he thought, hey, I can cut my own deals and get a better thing. And of course, he did an, an EA game. Probably didn't really pan out that well for him. Although he, maybe Nike, you know, he was able to do something instead of Converse or something. But uh, he eventually did get hit one of those NBA jams with the Jordan EPROMs because Gary Payton and he were really tight. And Gary Payton uh, is the, really the one who reached out to get himself in the game, Griffey in the game, and Jordan in the game. Uh, so that Jordan would have a copy. Shaq actually bought two copies when it came out, and this is a funny story. He took one of the coin ops, had it at home, and the other one went on their team airplane. As they, <laughs> as they traveled around the country on road trips, they would take it out of the plane and they would wheel it into his suite, and the players would gamble. He's told me this. They would gamble all night. They wouldn't go out to clubs and you know other stuff. They stayed in there gambling on NBA Jam. So in a way, we, in a way, we saved the world a little bit. From... <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, one more. more? Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you guys for letting me. Uh, beat my bur brother virtually as well as in real life in basketball. So that was, oh, that's great. That was something I really that's enjoyed great. doing. Um, just not so much on the, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Was there anything you guys could have done to keep the game at midway? Or was there things that you were like, man, I wish I really would have done that? Just for some other people that might yeah, be in the Yeah, it was really the, just the relationship. Uh, if we had had a, maybe a better relationship with the licensing management people there at the NBA, we, we could have... Um, you know, made the opportunity extend, and we would not have driven it into the ground uh, as they did. So, no. yeah, that's great. So this is a great birthday uh, present for yeah. me. A great opportunity. Thanks, everybody. So, yeah, thank Boom, shakalaka.